New Orleans Saints quarterback Drew Brees just finished up his 15th NFL season, a remarkable career. But if you go back to 2006, an offseason that he left, the Chargers ended up in New Orleans, but was very close to actually signing with Miami. What if Drew Brees would have become a Dolphin with Nick Saban in 2006? Well, that's what we're going to talk about today on Distant Replay. Come along. There's a lot of different scenarios at play, and many things could be different about the NFL and college football. This is Distant Replay. So we're going a little different direction on this Distant Replay. We're going to start a new series called What If, and we're kicking it off today with Drew Brees. What if Drew Brees would not have signed with the Saints, but instead signed with the Dolphins, right? That was the big discussion in 06. How would things have looked different for both franchises? And a lot of different other entities, teams, players, people would have been affected by that decision going a different direction. So welcome into Distant Replay. I am Ben George along with Mike Noto. Mike, this is a pretty interesting one, and I think we're, we're talking about it mainly because he's finishing up his career, probably done in the NFL, and you look back now, Hall of Famer Drew Brees, but you know nobody really expected him to get to this point, right? Uh, Drew Brees has come a long way from being a 27-year-old coming off major shoulder surgery as he was entering the offseason in 2006. I mean, like you said, I don't think anyone ever expected him to be a top-flight quarterback Maybe like a fringe pro bowler, but never what he's become. Let's start with some background on Brees. Bring you up to speed. I mean, most people are well aware of Drew Brees, but you know, you you maybe have forgotten about his college and early NFL career because of how good he's been since. But Brees was a three year starter at Purdue, threw for nearly twelve thousand yards, had a great career, was a very good quarterback. A lot of people remember him doing big things at Purdue, kind of putting them on the map. He was drafted by the San Diego Chargers, okay? First pick of the second round. Many people thought he was going to be a a kind of a mid-first-round pick, but the big questions on Drew Brees were his height, his arm strength, and whether or not he was kind of a system quarterback, right, playing in a spread offense at Purdue, would he get there? So, but, But when you look back, he was only the second quarterback taken after Michael Vick, so still highly thought of, but a lot of teams weren't really willing to take that first round draft pick risk on him yeah and that Chargers draft is going to go down in history because they drafted LaDainian Tomlinson in the first round uh, I think number five overall if I'm not mistaken yeah and then took Breeze at the top of the second round so great draft there uh in in San Diego for sure and like I said it'll go down in history but what's unique about Breeze is you know he never got any taller his arm strength never really increased and you know what Ben he was a system quarterback but it was just an awesome system (laughs) <laughs> fair enough yeah fair enough and he just kind of overcame everything to get to where he is today but you know he was taken by the chargers okay so rookie year 2001 he comes in to san diego doug flutie's the quarterback remember doug flutie there he only played one game that year did breeze uh, backing up doug flutie so not a lot to talk about rookie year so you head into 2002 flutie again he's kind of on the very end of his career here and there's a lot of talk whether or not it should be Flutie, should it be Drew Brees, what do you do? Chargers decide to go with Brees. He started all 16 games. Team started 6-1 and one that year, but finished 1-7. And, seven, and uh, the record overall was 8-8. Eight and eight. So kind of a back and forth. I don't think San Diego at that point really had any true idea of kind of where they stood with quarterbacks. Yeah, and Doug Flutie always seems to find his way into these situations, huh? Yeah. Where where he's always, he's always in the, we did at the uh, Music City Miracle a full episode on that. He was in a similar situation with Rob Johnson, sort of a young upstart that they wanted to give a chance to. I'm not comparing uh, Rob Johnson to Drew, Drew Brees, but on a side note, was this the smallest quarterback room ever with Drew Brees <laughs> and uh, Doug Flutie in it? I was going to say, like, yeah, you, know, you can kind of make the comparisons. And nobody really wanted to give Flutie a chance because they weren't quite sure. He didn't have the measurements and everything else, kind of like what Drew Drew Brees was, right? Didn't have all the the typical measurements that you would see from an NFL quarterback, and maybe that's why some people doubted him. But yeah, very unique quarterback room in San Diego at that point. 2003, started the year again as a starter. Team started the year, though, 1-7. So Flutie actually got a couple games in and started replacing him. Breeze eventually took back over, regained the job in Week 15, finished out the uh, end of the season. Then 0-4, 0-4 big year because the Chargers draft Phillip Rivers. 
This kind of begins the questions. Well, they traded for Phillip Rivers, but ultimately got him out of the draft. Breeze did go on to start 15 games that year. And Breeze kind of stepped up with that kind of added pressure in the locker room. They won the AFC West for the first time in 10 years. He was selected as a pro bowler, named the NFL comeback player of the year. And then, they, of course, they played your Jets in the wild card round in a very good overtime game. Yes, that was the Nate Kading game. So I will forever be indebted to Nate Kading <laughs> and his lack of ability to come up big with big kicks. But yes, that was a one of a couple big wins the Jets would have versus the Chargers in the playoffs over the years. And uh, yeah, m- remember that game very well. So four years in, his con- first contract's up. 05, the Chargers do decide to bring him back in. They give him the franchise designation. One-year deal. And he throws for a career high, thirty over 3,500 yards passing. He had the 10th best passer rating in the NFL. So he's starting to be kind of coming to his own. And you can kind of see he's got flashes of maybe being a quarterback that a franchise can kind of uh, tie itself to for long term and have success. But last game of the season, very last game against the Broncos, Flutie's going after a fumble, gets hit by Lynch, gets fallen on by another player on his arm. And boom, torn labrum, and he's out with a lot of question marks. So you go into the offseason, he goes to Dr. James Andrews. Everybody knows about Dr. James Andrews in Birmingham. He went underwent surgery, repaired the labrum. Uh, this was January 5th, 2006. And there's also reports about, does he have rotator, rotator cuff damage as well? So he was seeing multiple doctors. There was serious concern about his future. And I think that's what a lot of people forget about. At this point, Mike, there's legitimate concern, not just from like fans, but doctors that he'd never play again. Yeah, not only would he never play again, but remember we talked about at the top, this was a guy who didn't have a cannon of an arm anyway. Mm-hmm. Right? So now you add to this potential shoulder problems, and then the doctor's not being sure how these shoulder issues were going to impact him long term. And you can see not only A, why the Chargers, it was a no brainer for them to move on to Phillip Rivers, right? But B, why there was a lot of attention paid to his to his medical history and his medical evaluations once he entered the free agency period. Yeah, Dr. James Andrews even said uh, a couple of years ago in 2019 that at the time, all expectations were that he had a career-ending shoulder injury, um, but he credited the work ethic by Breeze and his physical therapist there in Birmingham that worked with him for a solid four months that it even defied the odds that he was even able to go back and play, not even at a high level, just the fact that he could actually suit up and go again in the NFL. And that's coming from Dr. James Andrews. So it tells you where they were, and I'm sure he had input with the staff at, at Miami with the Dolphins. So that's where they kind of are. But don't, don't forget, though, the Chargers actually offered him a contract, five years, $50 million, but it only paid a $2 million in base salary. That was a problem the first year, only $2 million guaranteed money. And the rest was ba- basically based on really heavily on incentives. So you forget that the Chargers did actually offer him a contract, but it was more or less like, hey, we'll commit to you for five years, but if you don't perform, you're not really going to get paid. Yeah, it was it was kind of like a uh, prove it every year kind of deal, which, again, coming off the shoulder, shoulder surgery like he was, you knew he was going to opt for a deal that gave him sort of more security and more money. Um, that's kind of like a – we want you, but we don't really want you kind of offer. So then it comes to New Orleans and Miami. These are basically the two teams that are really in the mix for Drew Brees. Dolphins bring him in for medical testing, obviously, to check out his shoulder. Um, he's also, at this time, the Dolphins are also talking to the Vikings about a trade with, with them for Dante Culpepper. Remember that? Remember him? He was also, though, coming off a serious knee injury at the time. So the Dolphins are here talking to two different quarterbacks who are coming off two different injuries and basically have two different, I guess, diagnoses moving forward. And the doctors in Miami basically said, listen, from all all accounts is, hey, yeah, you can take a chance on him, but if you want to pay him the money that he wants at this point, it's probably not going to be worth the risk because we're still uncertain about his future. So the Saints stepped up, gave him six years, 60 million, which had big guaranteed money in both the first and second year. I think ten million the first year, twelve million the second. So, you know, he had some serious money there. The Saints, a similar contract to the Chargers, but he got a lot more guaranteed money up front. So he went to the Saints. Well, the Dolphins, who again Nick Saban is the head coach going into his second year at this point, they decided to go with Dante Culpepper and brought him in. So that right there, Mike, I mean, that it's just a crazy time. The fact that they were looking at two different injured quarterbacks and 
everything for them pointed towards it's better off we go with Culpepper. This was the one decision that determined, if you think about it, Nick Saban's tenure as an NFL head coach. He picked the wrong injured quarterback, <laughs> you know, is essentially how you can look at it. Um, they go with Culpepper, like you mentioned. They had to trade for Culpepper, which was a big difference between him and Breeze. Right. They could have just signed Breeze. They, they traded for Culpepper. Culpepper was everything that Breeze wasn't as a player, right? Very naturally gifted, a, a rocket for an arm. And although coming off an injury, the Dolphins thought that was the safer way to go. Of course, with, the, with how things ended up, it's very ironic because one thing Breeze became known for throughout the rest of his career was how healthy he, he was. <laughs> and Culpepper only played four games with the Dolphins due to injuries. Yeah, and and listen, I, I've seen, you know, you kind of hear different things, and I know Nick Saban takes a lot of the heat for it, and you know I'm going to defend him here on this podcast. But I think a lot of it was medical doctors were just, hey, we can't, we can't sign him. So it wasn't like it was his ultimate choice, I don't think. I think it came down to the medical team. And they advise, I think, to go the other direction. So however it played out, ultimately, Culpepper's going to Miami. Breeze is going to New Orleans. So let's quickly remind you what happened from that point forward, okay? In Miami, the Dolphins started 2006 at 1-3. and three. This is under Culpepper. The teams that they had played at that point were 1-11 and 11 when not playing Miami, okay? So they were, they, they were awful, and they were awful against bad teams. Saban and Culpepper got into an argument in practice, a heated back and forth. Likely it was probably over an end the injury because Saban was resting him, saying he didn't look like he was 100%. Ultimately, he got benched until he could get healthy. And then in November, he went underwent another knee surgery to clear out some cartilage. And by December, he was placed on the injured reserve list. Now, there's been reports since that maybe Nick Saban, it wasn't much it's an injury thing as it was a head thing, and Nick Saban didn't want to deal with it and put him on there. But either way, by December, he was already – on the injured reserve list and not even playing for Miami. In January, Saban was off to Alabama. And then since then, the franchise has been to the playoffs twice, 2008, 2016, losing both those games. That's what's happened in Miami. In New Orleans, this is a franchise, again, remember, been to the playoffs five times in nearly 40 years. This is a franchise that, had, that has fans wearing bags over their heads to games because they're so embarrassed to be the Saints. Well, Breeze comes in first year they're in the NFC Championship game. A couple of few years later, they beat Peyton Manning and the Colts in Super Bowl 44, that in 2009. Then Drew Brees, okay, over these over 13 years, the next 13 years, he started at least 15 games every single season. And, and now, as of 2021 offseason, 17 career postseason starts. I mean, it, it is it li literally the exact opposite the way these two franchises have gone. So you're saying that – the Dolphins made the wrong choice. I believe you could argue that the Dolphins <laughs> went the incorrect direction. And you know what? So Breeze, Breeze's rise coincided perfectly with the city needing to rebuild after Katrina. We all know the story there. So Breeze is, I, I'm pretty confident in saying, we talk a lot about who is the guy for a city. I'm pretty confident as far as professional sports go that Breeze is the guy in New Orleans. Okay? Mm -hmm. So that's what we're dealing with, what he's become. He's become the, the, the guy in a major American city as far as sports goes. One thing of note here is that I think this ended up being a perfect match in New Orleans because Sean Payton also became the coach in the 2006 um, offseason as well. Sean Payton was not a no-brainer as a head coach choice, and Drew Brees was not a no-brainer as a quarterback choice. But they both took a chance on each other, and it's just one of those great stories. Okay. Remember, Sean Payton, what he was most known for in my eyes before he became head coach of the Saints was, do you remember that famous uh, Jim Fossil, uh, you know, we're putting our chips in the middle of the table? Yeah. Well, a big decision that came from that was he took the play calling duties away from Sean Payton that, that, for that run. And that was like what Sean Payton was known for from a lot of people up until he became head coach of the Saints. I think that's important to remember is that, you know, the Breeze Peyton marriage is thought very fondly of now, but was very much a risk. I think both of them were taking back then. Yeah, no question. One Drew Breeze quote I found very interesting. He said, quote, I just felt the energy in New Orleans. From the beginning, there was a genuine feeling that they wanted me here. And I think that was the biggest deal for Breeze. Remember, he went from getting a, I'll call it, you know, a BS Hail Mary contract offer from the Chargers that you that you just went through. His team that drafted him, giving up on him and drafting another quarterback in the top five. 
He then went to the Dolphins, who were not ready to commit to him because they thought he wasn't healthy. And he found a, a, a team in New Orleans and a coach in Peyton that believed in him. And I think that went a long way in his confidence. That and obviously we can get into a whole conversation about the system he played in and the fact that he played indoors, which I think was a, a huge factor in him becoming what he's become, the system and the fact that he didn't have to deal with weather in that division and playing at home in particular. We could get into all those conversations, but um, the facts are the facts. They were they have been one of the most consistent franchises in the NFL since Brees got there, and it's in large part due to the consistency of Drew Brees. Yeah, that's a great point and great perspective on kind of where we are with that. So that's what happened. That's the reality of the situation cur- currently as we stand 2021. So er, so the episode is about the what if. Let's start with the Saints, Mike. You kind of ta- you tapped into the Saints pretty well here. What's different with the Saints had they not gone with, with Brees? Obviously, we know they don't have the this, this success for as long as they've had it, but what else would be different? So the biggest what if for the Saints is what happens to their quarterback position if they do not sign Drew Brees? So who is their quarterback? Remember, that 06 draft, presuming they would have picked a quarterback if they did not sign Brees. Remember, they ended up picking Reggie Bush second overall, right? Right. Because they were 3-13 and 13 the year before, like you mentioned. The 06 quarterbacks in that draft were the first rounders were Vince Young, Jay Cutler, or Matt Leinart. Imagine if they ended up with one of those three. Yeah. And then if you want to look forward even to 2007, let's say they, they decided to pl- pick Reggie Bush because he was like a, thought to be a once-in-a-generation talent at the time. If they waited till 07 and picked a quarterback, they could have ended up with Jamarcus Russell or Brady Quinn. So that's the biggest what if. Like, wh- where do they, and then and what journeyman, stopgap veteran do they sign that, to sort of spin their wheels and waste even more time? Uh, it, it's just all fascinating to think about the what if. I know everyone talks about the what if from the Dolphins standpoint that you're going to get into here, but from the Saints standpoint, I mean, this is a franchise that they could be even worse off than they were before Breeze game. Yeah, I could definitely see envision them drafting Jamarcus Russell right there out of LSU number one overall pick, like that would have Great been the point. awesome story, right? Great and, point. And then that would have been a disaster. So And one other thing one other thing, Ben, is how how do we look at Sean Payton? Yeah. You know, is Sean Payton the guy who passed up on Drew Brees, picked the wrong quarterback, and sort of, you know, sputtered out as a pro coach. Right. You know, I think that's a great what if also. Yeah. How about the Dolphins? It's, I think it's a really interesting thing about the Dolphins because I think it changes a lot of things. Number one, I think if you do bring, bring Breeze in and he's playing at the level he does with the Saints right out of the gates, right, 2006 season, I, I think there's a really good chance that – I don't know that Nick Saban definitely stays, but I think there's a really good chance he does being a lot more comfortable having a quarterback he knows he's got for the long term. He's not dealing with a quarterback that's kind of a you know, a bit of a head case, it seems, by reports in, in Culpepper. So I think he'd be a lot more comfortable there. Things would be a lot better off, and they'd probably be winning more games. So what happens with the Dolphins, right? I think it's really cool to think about what happens in that division. This is a division you're very familiar with, obviously the AFCs. If you have Brady versus Breeze for that long, we think Brady versus Manning, you know, is a big rivalry. Think about having Brady versus Breeze that entire time in that division. Or even Belichick and Saban going head-to-head for who knows how long. Could still be even in that same situation. And then the other thing to think about with because of those two things is does the Patriots dynasty continue to get as high as it does and reach the level that it does if Breeze is in that division? Think of it this way. You mentioned the potential division. Take those four guys, Belichick, Saban, Breeze, and Brady. Think about football since 2006. And if I just said football to you and said name the top 10 people associated with football, you'd probably (laughs) name those four guys. Yeah. And to think about them in the same division, I have that in my notes as well. I don't think – look, your goal as an NFL head coach is to get your quarterback and sort of figure everything else out from there. So I, I, don't, I think it's pretty safe to say if Drew Brees came in and played in 2006 like he played in New Orleans or anything even close, Nick Saban, who knows what happened down the line, but that season he would not have went to Alabama. Yeah, but he would have had no need to leave, and I think he would have won games. And there's no, there's no doubt in my mind. I know a lot of people talk about, well, Saban is so successful because he's able to recruit and dominate recruiting, where the NFL is obviously a different setup. And 
I just, I mean, I think that's all kind of bogus. I mean, sure, he didn't have a great uh, two-year run, but he went nine and seven and six and ten, and that's about as good as the Dolphins have been in for the last twenty years. Okay, so it's not like, it's not like he was uh, a worse coach than anything else they've had. He started to kind of get him going. It seemed like, but then this quarterback situation just just sunk him, and then he he left for Alabama. I think there's there's no question that he's a, if he gets that thing going that he'd have success long term. I have no question about that. And I think the Dolphins, with that success, he probably wouldn't have had to leave. Now maybe he wanted to leave eventually for college because maybe he's built more for college in terms of, you know, training guys and kind of mentoring guys and kind of being that that leader and help mold guys. You don't really do that in the NFL. So I don't know. I don't know where his mind would be, but I think maybe he would have left eventually. But I don't think it would have been Alabama at that point. So you know, I can't even think of what college football would be like without Nick Saban the last thirteen, uh, the last uh, fifteen yeah. years. That's the you know, part it's, it's of it, crazy man. to even think about. Um, he's literally become the best coach in college football history in the last fifteen years. <laughs> yeah, which again was not on people's radar either fifteen years ago. You know, he's thought of as being a very good coach, but not obviously not an immortal like he is now. Um, that's happened definitely in the last fifteen years. And I, I think the college football conversation is one that's really unique and interesting, too, because I mean, it doesn't really just change the landscape of college football. It, it does completely. But, you know, think about Alabama. That I don't, I don't think that program may, – maybe things have changed and they, they were able to go out and get somebody at that point, like four or five years later. But I think the coaches that were out there at that point, nobody's special when you look back. I think they, would have, they were already in a bad, bad spot to begin with. I think that program is like Nebraska right now, and Nebraska is just an afterthought, essentially. I think it changes LSU's trajectory with Les Miles probably becoming the head of the conference and being the face of the conference because we had no competition from Alabama, and that the West would have been a very weak division uh, outside of maybe Auburn at that point. And who knows, maybe even changes Tennessee. I mean, you look at all the coaches that have turned over in the SEC, like the number of coaches that have been in the SEC since Saban took over. You know, some of these programs would probably have still have guys and guys would have jobs without it. Um, but you can even go further and like talk about maybe the playoff. Does a playoff happen as soon as it does if Alabama and LSU weren't doing the rematch in the BCS and Alabama wasn't kind of forcing the hand of, of uh, some of the decision makers at some point? I don't know. There's there's a lot there, but I think the landscape of college football looks even much more different than the NFL does at this point. But, you know, the Dolphins, Saints, those two, those two franchises, man. I can't imagine the difference there. And I think that's probably why people hate Saban as much as they do, just because this thing played out the way it did. And, and it wasn't really even Saban's fault necessarily. I know the way he exited was kind of uh, maybe a bad look to some, but I think just a lot of people hate Saban because they were stuck with Culpepper and they saw what Breeze did. If Breeze didn't pan out, I, I, maybe they don't have as much animosity towards Saban. I don't know. Well, the Dolphins, the Dolphins fans are bitter because of one simple fact. This whole scenario we just talked about during this episode ended up great and franchise changing and program changing for everyone involved except for the Dolphins. Yeah, they had it. Yeah, they were. They could have had everything essentially. Because <laughs> look, the Chargers, that. the Chargers even end, the Chargers ended up fine. Mm -hmm. You know, um, you know, not not as good as the Saints, but they they were a pretty consistent winner over the years. The, obviously, the Saints ended up great. Alabama ended up great. Nick Saban ended up. Like I just said, becoming an immortal, and then the Dolphins were left holding the bag. Dolphins are like bottom four franchise over that time period, right? Is that is that fair to say? I w yeah, I'm trying to think who would be worse. I mean, um, the Browns, the Bengals, I think, or although the Bengals have the had Bengals, better yeah, success, the, yeah, yeah, the Bengals were actually pretty good during that time period. I mean, outside of that one sort of blip year with um, Chad Pennington, <laughs> uh, where they won a division, yeah. I, I I can't think of any good seasons they had. Yeah, they they they've been in the playoffs twice. That's it. It's, which is remarkable because you're talking about a franchise that had some of the best success in the 80s of anybody and uh, in 90s even. So I don't know. It's a what if conversation that you can probably have for a long time. Great to crack open a beer, or sit back around a fire, and and talk about the what ifs. But Drew Brees is a big one. What if he would have signed with the Dolphins and not the Saints? What would have happened to a lot of different people, teams? organization cities all this stuff very cool to think about we'll have more what if scenarios coming up more what if episodes down the road if you have something in mind send it over to us distant replay podcast.com is the website you can connect with us on twitter instagram and also youtube please subscribe rate and review the podcast spread the word tell a friend tell a family member about us 
We'd appreciate that. Mike, enjoy this conversation and, uh, and the what ifs. Same here, Ben. Hopefully this is one of many what ifs to come. And until next time.